two-part question. Next week, if you want to read ahead, we'll be starting a study in 1 Corinthians, if you want to start reading ahead. Uh, but still, you know, please still put your Berean questions in the boxes on the table, uh, whether it's in regard to something that we discussed on Sunday morning in a message, or maybe a question you have regarding the faith or an issue of the day and how it relates to the Bible. I think it's a nice break between books so we can take these questions from, from people in our congregation and discuss them. So uh, you can also go to our website and put your questions there under the Berean tab if you want to do that. Also, i got some great news, too. Many people have been putting their prayer requests in those boxes, too. I mean, a lot of prayer requests. And it's getting to be the point where we're putting a team together now, a prayer team that's going to be praying over those requests because there are so many of them. That's, that's great. That's what we should be doing. We should be praying. So please continue to place those prayer requests in the boxes also. And even your praise reports, if you have an answered prayer, you know, that's great encouragement to those that are praying. So uh, a prayer request, a praise report, put that in the, in the boxes too, or, 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 or email us or put it on the website so we can kind of be working together in this thing. Um, also too, I have a prayer request this morning for everybody on behalf of uh, Pastor Ben. Pastor Ben is going in for eye surgery on Tuesday, um, so keep him in prayer on that. So keep uh, Pastor Ben in, in prayer for uh, Tuesday for his, uh, for his uh, eye surgery, okay? So let's get on to our burning question for today. The question has to do with doubt when it comes to our faith. Who has that problem, doubt, when it comes to your faith? Anybody? So we have about five honest people in the room. Good. Remember, you're in church before you answer that question. Actually, this question is a two-part question the person wrote. The person asks about doubt from a believer's perspective and from the perspective of a person that is looking to believe, but maybe their doubts are keeping them from doing so. So uh, let me read the questions, actually, kind of get started here. This person writes, while it is clear that all believers experience doubt, I mean, it's all believers, how are we to distinguish between doubt and actual disbelief? How are we to prevent doubt from crossing into disbelief? And should we be worried about this as believers? Then this person goes on to write, it can also be said of people, or what can we say of people who read the Bible, go to church, want to be Christian, but just can't bring themselves to believe for whatever reason. Do such people even exist? Yes. Or does God compel belief of himself for any honest seeker after truth who longs to be Christian? So I, I titled the message today actually using a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. If you're familiar with Elizabeth Elliot, uh, she was married to the missionary Jim Elliot, who along with his companions was killed by a tribe of people in South America that they were trying to evangelize. She later spent two years as a missionary to the same tribe of people that killed her husband. And here's that quote. Don't dig up in doubt what you have planted in faith. So don't dig up in doubt what you have planted in faith. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you, Father, for... Uh, for faith, Lord. We thank you, Father, that uh, that you have spoken to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and, and those that believe we have placed it, our, our faith and our trust and our hope in you. And Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, Lord, through his sacrifice that, that made all that possible. So Father, this morning, as we as we look at this subject of, of doubt, Lord, that we would look at our, ourselves, Lord, that we would examine ourselves, Lord, and see what's in our hearts, Lord. And Father, more importantly, uh, uh, as we experience those times of doubt, and they will come, how we can uh, work through those times, Lord, and how it can actually increase and grow our faith in you. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Okay, so, doubt. Doubt is a problem even for the righteous. What person in the Bible comes to your mind when we talk about doubt? Yell it out. Peter. Thomas. Thomas. Oh, Thomas. How's he referred to as? Doubting. doubting Thomas. So, Doubting Thomas. Doubt is part of his nickname, after all, if you want to call it a nickname. Poor Thomas. Uh, how do you go through life with a name like that attached to your name? He needs like a PR guy to give him some good PR. But think about this. In John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas who we call Doubting Thomas, makes the most profound statement of faith after seeing Jesus. He says, my Lord 
and my God. But yet he's still known as Doubting Thomas. Thomas reminds us that faith, even the kind of faith that we are willing to die for, does not exclude doubt and questions, nor does it exclude moments when we wonder whether God is truly with us. Sometimes God may seem distant and unresponsive as we face difficulties. Faith is not always clear and unchallenged. Yet we are asked to believe in the midst of questions and the uncertainties that surround us. Who's another great man of faith in the New Testament who has struggled with doubt? Peter. Peter? Who else? Anybody think of anybody else? He was in prison, waiting to be executed, most likely. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. How about John the Baptist? When he was in prison, awaiting certain death, he asked two of his disciples to ask Jesus, or to go to Jesus and ask him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? This is the same John, the forerunner of Christ, his cousin, who he baptized and proclaimed of Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now he's asking this question. He saw the Spirit of God descend upon him when he was baptized, and that same John, now in prison, even has his doubts. I really like Jesus' response to both of these men of faith. There was no rebuke of John the Baptist by Jesus. Jesus knew John, he loved John, and he understood the trial that John was going through. Jesus responds with the words from the prophet Isaiah that John would know and provide him with the reassurance he so desperately needed. Let me read you those words that Jesus sends back to John. Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. John knew what those words meant. He knew that was words of the Messiah. Just as Jesus met Thomas and John the Baptist where they were and revealed himself to them, he will meet us where we're at and reveal himself to us. In fact, how much more is Christ willing to do for those who struggle with faith and doubt today? You look to the cross, you'll find your answer. So how do we distinguish between doubt and unbelief? And how do we prevent doubt from crossing into unbelief? First off, doubt is not unbelief. Remember the man in Mark chapter 9, verse 24? He cried out to Jesus when he needed his son to be healed. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So how does doubt actually then become unbelief? Unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. It's a deliberate decision to reject Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. In the Bible, that's referred to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises in the context of faith. Like the man who cried to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It's a wistful longing to be sure the things in which we trust are true. But it is not, and need not, be a problem for us. Just because I can't prove my faith in God doesn't mean that it's wrong. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Now I was trying to use an earthly example of this. And I can't even begin to tell you how an airplane takes off and flies. I know it has something to do with aerodynamics and lift and whatever else, but I still have no idea how that giant hunk of metal that weighs tons gets off the ground. But I'll get on board because I trust that it will. Just because I can't prove to you how it flies doesn't mean that it can't. Think through what will happen if Satan can manage to get you obsessed with your doubts. He's that guy that wants to hand you the shovel to dig up your doubts. The more you worry about your doubts, the less you will look to God. And isn't that what Satan really wants? Gradually, your vital links with the life-giving grace of God will wither, and your spiritual life will wither up and shrivel up. Do you know how doubt becomes unbelief? It becomes unbelief because we, 
you, me, because we allowed it to. You ever hear that saying, I think I got this right, feed a cold, starve a fever? How about this? Feed your doubts and your faith will starve. Feed your faith and your doubts will starve. <clears throat> Doubt initially becomes a problem and may finally become unbelief only and only if you let it. And these pitfalls can be avoided. Don't feel ashamed about your doubts and don't dwell on them either. In the long run, and I mean the long run, in all eternity, I'm quite sure that Thomas and John the Baptist weren't ashamed but were overjoyed to see Jesus again. And that brings us to the second part of our Marine question. What about those people that go to church, read the Bible, want to be Christian, profess to be Christian, but just can't bring themselves to believe for whatever reason? The questioner asked, do such people exist? Does God compel belief of himself for any honest seeker who longs to know the truth? And I think the key word our questioner used, if I remember, was an honest seeker. An honest seeker. Many places in the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, for example, tells us, If you will seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Proverbs 18, or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 17, And those that seek me diligently will find me. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, Jesus speaking. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the Bible tells us that those who seek after God, honest seekers, if we want to use that term, as our questioner phrased it, will find him. So what about those that are doing all the right things, going to church, reading their Bible, wanting to know him, but can't seem to take that final step in faith? What is holding them back? Or who is holding them back? Pride would be one. When we ask who is holding them back, it'd be easy to say, well, Satan. And of course, that may be part of the answer. But who is really holding them back is themselves. Remember the story of, of the rich young ruler? Jesus told him what he needed to do to follow him, but he couldn't give up that part of his life. We have free will to choose or reject Christ. We will all stand before God and face our own choices, whatever they may be, and we will know that we were the ones who chose to believe or reject him. So wherever you may find yourself this morning, whether you are a believer that has struggled with doubt or is struggling with doubt, or you've not made that step in faith to believe even though you want to, here are some things to think about and some things you can do to get over that hump, if you want to call it that. You, you need to work through these things, or whatever things may be hindering you. And don't stop seeking him when you do. Even if you need to get counseling, even professional Christian counseling to help you work through them, if you hit an impasse. For example, if you have unforgiveness towards someone and are holding on to it, not willing to forgive or to listen to Jesus' command to forgive, and yes, it's a command from Jesus, not a suggestion. You may be hindering your own progress to God in your own life. And some of us, I know, we've experienced tragic or, or heartbreaking wrongs from others, causing severe wounds, and yet we are still told to forgive. When we're not willing to forgive, our unforgiveness stops our progression towards God, 
and then we will become weak and our doubt will grow. And by the way, Satan loves it when we don't forgive one another. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says one of Satan's devices is to cheat the believer out of true forgiveness. And then he looks to divide us amongst each other. Another example, when you misunderstand or misapply God's word and apply misguided things to the principles in your life, resulting in what feels like a heavy burden to follow Christ, you can become discouraged and then slip away. And unfortunately, sometimes it may not be our own misunderstanding of the word, but what we've learned or heard from misinformed teachers and counselors, run everything you hear by the word. Keep seeking truth until you find it. Be a Berean, like we talked about those Berean boxes on your table. Be a Berean. Test everything by the word, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Test all things. And here's one that hits home for me. In fact, we uh, kind of observed this once a year at our house. We did this last night. We call it our Gilgal Day. If you need to know what Gilgal is, look it up. It's in the Old Testament in Joshua. Gilgal is the first place where the children of Israel, when they crossed over the Jordan in the Promised Land. We have our own little Gilgal Day celebration that we do. So this one hits home for me. When you're not willing to surrender. When you are not willing to surrender your own desires or will to, to, uh, to hinder God's will, it will hinder you. And those things can be in different areas of your life, pieces of your life, not totally surrendering everything to him. If you have a deep desire to do things your way, not God's way, wanting to run your, love, your life apart from the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Maybe you heard of this book, old book, called God is My Co-Pilot. It should be titled the other way around. When I take over the controls from God, things start spiraling down. God should be my pilot. I shouldn't even be the co-pilot. I should be back in, in baggage or something. <laughs> well, that was me, where I found myself many years ago now. I think we said last night, like 20 years ago. Our problems, our troubles were real. They were in the form of financial difficulties, as many are, and they were so bad that me and Teresa and our six kids at the time, we were days away from being homeless. I walked away from God. I knew he was real, but somehow he forgot about me and my family. I stopped going to church. I stopped praying. My doubt had consumed me. I was digging up doubt by the bucket loads that had originally been planted in faith. And I was digging them up. But looking back, I had given myself over to the sin of wanting to run my life without God. I was Lord of my life, not God. The problem was that I had really messed it up, but I wasn't willing to let him back in because of my pride. I needed to take the instruction from James chapter 4, verse 10, and humble myself in the sight of the Lord, and then he would lift me up. I needed to submit. What I also discovered was, although my doubts did not keep God from graciously blessing me and my family, he did still lovingly discipline me. And after that, I was able to share in his holiness once again. I may have given up on God. Praise God, he didn't give up on me. Doubt is something that every single Christian needs to deal with. It's a normal part of our walk. We grow our faith by dealing with it and working through it. For some of us, doubt tempts us to be afraid of things or doubt tempts us to worry about money or the future or whatever. It's in those areas of weakness that we must overcome sin and destroy the doubt before it results in unbelief. 
So here's two antidotes for doubt, or the vaccine for doubt. So I'm talking about vaccine in the news so much. First one is the knowledge of God, who he is, and everything he is. The more we know God, the more we know this world has nothing that can stand against him and his guidance for our lives. And the second is that love that we have for God. The more we talk and develop a personal relationship with God, the more we understand and the more we trust him. Even though he leads us through very difficult times to understand things, we will wait on him because we know he is God. Knowing God and developing that love-based relationship with him will serve to destroy doubt in your life. So if you're struggling right now with doubt, even maybe to the point of unbelief, I want to pray for you before we close today. I knew what it was like all those years ago, and I know what it's like now. At some point in your life, oh, I don't think you'd be here today or listening today, you planted some seed of faith, whether big or small, and it has grown to where it is today. Maybe it has deep roots. Maybe it doesn't yet. Either way, don't dig up needlessly what you planted in faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Father, again for what your word tells us, Lord, about you. And I thank you.